Hi, good evening, and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's latest Facebook Live presentation, Migrate, Hibernate, Tolerate. Very catchy title put together by Stephanie Keeler, our, <laughs> our presenter today, and uh, obviously a great show on tap. So, Stephanie, thanks so much for presenting for us, and thank you for joining us tonight uh, as we have our latest Facebook Live broadcast. My name is Rashid Clark. I'm the Marketing Specialist at the Riverwood Conservancy. Hope you're doing well and staying safe. Uh, before we get to today's presentation, just a couple of housekeeping notes from us. First of all, our first ever BioBlitz is on right now at Riverwood. Uh, for more details, head to our website, the Riverwood Conservancy. Org. On our website, you'll see all the information about the BioBlitz, just what is a BioBlitz, how you can get involved and help take part in citizen science and help us get a better idea of all of the plant and wildlife that exists inside Riverwood. And as a result of your nature spotting uh, experiences between now and the end of December, you could win some great prizes, including a signed copy of a Dave Taylor wildlife photography book, which is great reading and great visuals. So you'll want to Get all the details on that. Again, head to our website, theriverwoodconservancy.org, for more information about our BioBlitz. And also, while you're on our website, you might have a look at our nature gift guide, uh, which is a great way to send something special to someone that you care about, and at the same time, do good for the environment and help us in our environmental efforts. So, again, all the details are on our website. And as before, we get to the presentation today. Just a heads up that Stephanie will have some questions for you throughout the presentation. So we're gonna be testing your knowledge of nature as well. So if you have uh, answers to the questions or questions of your own tonight, please type them into the comments and we'll pop them up uh, here on Facebook as we go along. And so I'll turn things over to Stephanie Keeler, who is an experienced environmental educator and enthusiast. She completed her degree in biology and geography at the University of Guelph and has spent several years submersing herself in Ontario's biodiversity in the forests of Algonquin Park. And she's currently the community program coordinator here at the Riverwood Conservancy. So Stephanie, I'll throw things over to you. Thanks so much, Rashid, and thank you for the great bio. That's awesome. Uh, good it's almost like you wrote it for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are going to be exploring the winter woodlands of Riverwood and talking about how all the different species have adapted for winter time. Um, before we get started, uh, Rashid and I would just like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. Um, both of us are very grateful to be working on such a, a great land um, and be able to use it recreationally as well. So I would just like to say thank you for that. And another thank you, a special thank you to Dave Taylor tonight. Um, most of these images are actually from his wildlife photography page. So thank you very much, Dave, for donating these to us. Um, and also uh, to Algonquin Provincial Park for the inspiration because I kind of started my career in Algonquin Park and I got inspiration from one of their children's programs that I used to do up there. So thank you as well, if anyone's watching from there. Now, in all seasons here at Riverwood, we have great things to see. There's always people on site here in the springtime. It's great for wildflowers um, and finally getting back outdoors after a, a long winter. In the summertime, you can come here with your dogs or you can come fishing. It's a really great place to meet friends and just go for a hike. In the fall, great for fall colors, obviously, but also a lot of people are attracted to the salmon run that happens every year in October up the Credit River. And then in the winter time, it's a little bit quieter on site just because a lot of people People are scared to come out in the winter time hopefully I'll change your mind about that today um, winter is a great place to come to Riverwood because we have lots to see on site um, and I think a biggest a big attraction is feeding the actual birds straight from your hands so chickadees nut hatches and all those sorts of things and I'll be talking a little bit about that later on now, winter is easy for us humans because we can just stay inside and we can put on a bathrobe and snuggle up and drink hot chocolate and watch movies when it gets really cold. But it's very difficult for all of the animal species that live at Riverwood. One of the main reasons is their food resources depleted um, greatly after the winter or during the winter, sorry. So animals that eat anything like seeds, berries, nuts, um, flowers, or they rely on the nectar of the flowers, all of those things are gone during the winter time. So 
one of the reasons why these animals have to adapt is they don't have the food resources that they normally have throughout the summer, the spring, and the fall. So now they have to think of a new way, how am I going to get food to survive? Another really big uh, barrier or challenge that these animals have to deal with is how cold it is outside. Especially here in Canada, we have very cold winters. And if you were to go outside, you put on hats and mitts and coats and and winter boots but these animals they just have their fur or they just have their feathers so they have to have a lot of resources and eat a lot of food in order to have enough energy to survive the winter cold um, which can be quite difficult and another reason why these animals have to adapt totally different lifestyles throughout the winter time so that's where we're going to get into migrate hibernate and tolerate um, those are kind of the three main things or main adaptations that our river woods animals um, do in the winter time in order to survive. Um, we're going to start with migrate. Um, I think it's the one everyone's most familiar with. And we have a Canada goose as an example of a migratory animal. Um, often when you first think of migration, you think of the Canada goose flying south for the winter time in that V formation. Um, migration can come in all different kinds of ways though it doesn't have to just be birds um, migration can be seasonal it can be long distance it can be short distance it can be even just daily um, which I'll be talking about in a second but Canada goose is usually the first one especially here in Ontario that comes to our mind Another example of migration um, are our whales, things like that. Um, there's many different species that migrate and maybe not in the way that you would normally think. So this is an image of a humpback whale and they migrate every single year, um, sometimes from Alaska all the way down to areas like Hawaii in order to breed and mate. So they swim out of cooler waters and they try to get to warmer waters in the winter time. So it's kind of just like the birds do, but we don't really, um, we don't really associate migration with whales a lot of the time. And even the really, really tiny things that are in the water near whales are migrating. So things like phytoplankton, really, really small. Um, there's invertebrates, very small invertebrates, small um, algae that are migrating every single day. So for example, phytoplankton, that every night they migrate to the surface of the water to feed, and then every um, every day they rotate with the water and they go back down to the, the lower levels of the water. So they're migrating as well. It's not in the same way that we think migrating is. Um, in a seasonal way, it's daily instead, which is pretty interesting too. So I have our first question here. It's super, super simple. Um, this is a great blue heron uh, feeding on the shorelines of the Credit River in Riverwood. And the great blue heron migrates as well, not as far as other species. They're just basically migrating to areas that have open water for them to feed. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone can name any other animals, it doesn't have to be birds, it can be anything. Does anyone know any other animals that migrate on a daily or seasonal basis? All right, so we'll throw that question out to the audience here. And uh, anyone with answers, please type them into the comment section. There'll be a little bit of a delay, I think, between the broadcast and the typing of uh, answers. So Stephanie, want to just uh, repeat the question one more time for everyone? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So there's, um, like I was saying before, Canada goose is usually the first one you think about when you think of migration. But there's so many other species around our world that migrate in different ways. And I'm just wondering if anybody has any off the top of their mind that they know of. All right, so name migrators, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah so drop them into the comment section um, and we'll, we'll get to them as we go along. First thing that came to mind for me, honestly, was uh, puffins. I don't know why. Okay. Uh, and I, and okay. I think it's probably because when I was on a trip to Newfoundland, I do remember seeing or remember reading that puffins mate for life. I, I hope I'm right on that. And that there'd be like a long trip uh, you know, from, from for people uh, or for the puffins as they make their uh, migratory paths. Uh, so that's just one that that, that that came to mind. I could be way off on that. Uh, qu or comments from uh, from uh, CMK butterflies, maybe would that be uh, considered a migrator? That's a great okay. one. And that is from yeah. Audrey bats. 
Bats, that's also a great one. I love those. And uh, along the same line from Joyce, uh, monarch butterflies. Yes, we know that. Mm -hmm. And Fatima, salmon. Salmon, awesome. And yes, yeah, that's really great to hear because people aren't just picking um, bird species, but also mammals, fish, insects, right? Like there's so many different animals around the world that migrate. Absolutely. Uh, although bird seems to be the the kind of popular choice, probably the low the low hanging fruit when it comes to this uh, question. Uh, bluebirds uh, from Anna and Joyce also with hummingbirds. So yeah, birds seem to be the the front runner here. Uh, but yeah, um, especially the the notes on uh, on insects and fish. Yeah, the, you know, migration is not just for uh, our feathered friends. Mm -hmm. But I will be going into our feathered friends next, even though I said say something else. But feathered friends. <laughs> And um, bef before we do, just a last couple of uh, answers here, just because I'm also curious, buffalo? Buffalo, okay, yeah. And I think probably my favorite answer here, sharks. Is what? Sharks. Sharks. <laughs> I'm not an expert on that. And, yeah, a a aquatic wildlife, we'll have, to, we'll have to double check on that. Yeah, we'll have to look uh, at that. No, there's uh, no whales or sharks in Riverwood, so. <laughs> that we know of, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Well, great. Thanks for the uh, the answers, everyone. We'll we'll have another uh, round of questioning uh, questioning a, a little bit later on as we get through the presentation. But uh, thanks for for dropping all, all your answers in, uh, and we're we're going to be testing your knowledge a little bit more as we go through the presentation. So I'll, I'll send it back to you, Stephanie. Awesome. And if you have any questions during the presentation too, like just throw them out there and we can answer them as we go. Absolutely. Um, so I I know somebody did mention hummingbirds. Uh, they're pretty. Uh, incredible animals. They are birds which migrate, uh, but they they do it in a in a, a a really big way. So if you think about a, a hummingbird, they're very small species of birds. They're very tiny, um, and they don't rely on the food resources that other birds rely on. So they're relying strictly on nectar from flowers, whereas other birds are re relying on high calorie things like. Um, insects and nuts and seeds and berries, these hummingbirds are just relying on flowers blooming and producing this nectar for them to survive. Um, so in the wintertime, we obviously don't have blooming flowers, so these hummingbirds have to migrate. Now, in Ontario, we have one species of hummingbird. It's called the ruby-throated hummingbird. This one you see on your screen right now is a female because she doesn't have that bright red chin under her. Um, but these little guys, oh, sorry. These little guys do migrate really far. So they migrate all the way down to Central and South America, places like Mexico, uh, Panama, Costa Rica. They're flying huge distance for the size of their bir the bird. Um, when they get down there too, they have tons of competition. So you can imagine here in Ontario, we only have one species of hummingbird, not a lot of competition against other birds because not a lot of birds are even relying on flowers themselves. Um, so they don't have to compete with many species. They fly all the way to Central and South America, and then there's 50 plus species of hummingbirds there that are there all year round and have territories and are very territorial in general. And just as an example, um, the ruby-throated hummingbird is 3.5 inches tall. Hummingbirds that could be there could be 4.5 to 6 inches tall. And you know, one to two inches difference doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're a 3.5 inch high bird, it is a lot. And these guys get chased off very quickly by the bigger hummingbirds that live down there. So it can be quite difficult for them to actually survive. Um, it's not so easy, but they have to do it because in the wintertime, they would have no food resources to survive at all. And I know we already kind of talked about this one, but does anybody know what species of caterpillar this guy is? It's a migrator as well. I think we already kind of hinted at it. And yeah, so we'll uh, throw that question out to you, the audience, again. So please drop your answers into the comments section. What is it that we're looking at in the middle of the screen here? Looks very exotic, I will say. It does. Looks toxic, too. It's to okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> looks, looks exotic, is toxic, uh, and is this something that, you, that we could find at Riverwood? 
Oh, absolutely. They're all over Riverwood throughout the summertime um, and into the into parts of the fall as well. You can find these caterpillars. They are very hungry. They're constantly eating food. They're always eating and trying to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'll explain a little bit why in a second. Okay, so uh, some answers coming in. A monarch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or uh, kind of specifically here, a monarch caterpillar. Nice. And from Anna, a swallowtail. Oh, that's a really good guess too. Okay, so um, the first two were correct. It is a monarch butterfly. Um, but I will say the swallowtail caterpillar does look very similar. It's also black, white, and yellow. It has similar similar uh, coloration. So that's a really great guess as well. Um, so this is a monarch butterfly, um, or monarch butterfly caterpillar, I should say. And they are eating and eating and eating and eating and trying to get big enough because they have a huge journey ahead of them. So even when they're adults, um, then they're drinking nectar. Um, so this is a, an adult monarch butterfly actually on a, it, it looks like a butterfly bush, which is a, a big type of plant, really great for a lot of different pollinators. So um, they're eating a lot as caterpillars and then they drink a lot of nectar as well to have energy. In the fall, these monarchs actually do a huge migration, similar to the one as a hummingbird. So the monarch butterflies that live here in Ontario, they migrate all the way to Mexico. And the monarch butterflies that you find more out west, they'll migrate to places like California. Now, something very interesting about these monarch butterflies is that they will go through four to five generations within a year. So they'll go from adult, the adult will lay an egg, the egg will hatch into a caterpillar, the caterpillar will pupate or turn into a pupa, and then that will hatch into an adult again. And that um, lifestyle will go uh, four to five different times within a year. Now the last generation that is born within the fall is slightly different and they actually suppress these genes inside of them. And those genes that would normally make their reproductive glands um, they suppress this gene so they're no longer uh, reproductive, they can't have more eggs, and instead they use that energy to get slightly larger and more durable. And that's because these butterflies are flying in such great distances that they have to be larger and more durable, um, especially when they're crossing over water bodies and stuff like that. They would be just wished away in the in the wind very easily. So the butterflies are slightly bigger, the ones that go down to Mexico. Once they are in Mexico, they all kind of um, come together on one type of tree. It's called an omeal uh, fir tree. So there'll be thousands of these monarch butterflies in Mexico hanging off these trees, staying warm throughout the wintertime. They'll be here for several months. And after it starts to be spring again, it starts to warm up. Um, the sun is in a different place in the sky. Uh, the monarchs have this instinctual um, want to migrate again and they begin their migration back north towards Ontario. Now that larger butterfly that was no longer um, reproductive now creates those reproductive glands that it suppressed originally and it reproduces once and that's normally in around Texas but then they die so they don't make it all the way back to Ontario which is unfortunate and kind of sad story um, that they did all this work and then they don't get back to their breeding grounds. They do lay an egg in around Texas and then that monarch butterfly continues its journey north towards Ontario. And the cycle just continues to go again and again and again. It's, it's pretty incredible what they do, especially knowing how far this little tiny insect is going. Um, but they have to do it. They will not survive otherwise. So we're going to move into hibernation now, um, a little bit of a, a different kind of topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about three different kinds of hibernation. The first one is true hibernators. So some species of bats hibernate in caves. There'll be hundreds of thousands of them. They Some of them will migrate great distances to all come together in one location, and then they'll hibernate. True hibernators are animal species that basically completely shut down their bodies. So 
Um, they slow their heart rate down. Um, I think bats, it's like one beat per 10 minutes or something like that, like very crazy. Um, they're, they're slowing their blood pressure down. All of their internal organs are slowing down. They are in a deep sleep. And if you were to poke them, they would not wake up. Um, so that's what a true hibernator is. Brumation is the um, is very similar, but it's the version for uh, reptiles and amphibians. So brumation and true hibernators are the same basically, but for different kinds of animals. So hibernators would be like mammals, brumation would be for reptiles and amphibians like turtles, salamanders, snakes, and things like that. They as well are shutting down their body. And I'll tell a really crazy story about um, a type of amphibian that does that as well. And then the third kind is called torpor. And basically this is an animal species that goes to into a deep sleep, um, but they're not truly hibernating. So they'll go into a sleep, but they'll wake up occasionally throughout the winter time to go and feed. And then they'll go back to sleep in their den and then they'll wake up again. So if you were to poke this animal when they were sleeping, they would wake up. Um, so I do have another question for you guys. Um, bears are often the first thought in your head, much like Canada geese is for um, migration. Bears are often uh, what the first thing that pops into people's heads when they think about hibernation. So I'm wondering where would bears fit in these three categories? Are bears true hibernators? Are they brumation or do they go through torpor in the winter time? Okay, good question again, which we will pose to you, the audience. So uh, yes, bears known for the hibernation. We have that kind of stereotypical view of bears just like falling asleep for the rest of the, for the whole winter. Uh, and would you say that they are true hibernators? Bro would brumator be the right term? Or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, let us know uh, what your best guess is uh, from Aline going with torpor. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll wait for a few more uh, comments to come through. And it, from Rosemary, once again, on the torpor side. So that seems to be the popular vote right now. And one more from Joe, also torpor. Although from a, a little bit of, okay, so now we're, getting, now we're getting a little bit of everything. True hibernation from Sheena. Okay. And from Carol, true hibernation. But it does seem as though torpor, true hibernator, seem to be the the two front runners here in terms of what what would what would bears be classified as. So Stephanie, why don't you let us know what the correct answer is here? Yeah, so it's great that people actually got that that <laughs> correct. Um, bears actually go through with torpor, so we often associate bears with being true hibernators. They go to sleep, their heart rates way down, all their internal organs are slowing down, but that's not the case. Bears are eating tons and tons of food in the fall. They're eating nuts and seeds and berries, and then they go into their den, and often they have um, bear cubs during this time as well. They go into their den, and they will actually just be sleeping, but they'll wake up and they'll sleep and they'll wake up. So it's actually more like torpor, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, bear researchers that will go and try to see the health of the, the bear cubs, they'll actually have to tranquilize the mom in the den um, just because if they were to go into the den, she would actually wake up and be very aggressive if they were taking out the bear cub. So it's something very interesting um, that we always associate it with hibernation, but they're not really in hibernation. They just go for a, a quick sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Now, an example of a true hibernator, one that actually completely goes to sleep, slows down its heart rate, slows down its internal organs, will not wake up, is, um, I guess this is like Riverwood's bear. Um, <laughs> this is a groundhog. So groundhogs will go underground and they will stay underground all winter long and sleep the uh, sleep the cold weather away. So they'll be eating lots of food just like a bear does um, throughout the season and then go to sleep and shut down um, their heart rate. These little guys will, um, their heart will beat five times a minute when they are in hibernation. A very similar hibernating story to our groundhog, but it's a little bit more difficult for this guy. 
This is called a woolly bear caterpillar or um, a more scientific term is Isabella tiger moth. Um, I'm sure if you come to Riverwood often um, throughout the summer or the fall, you've seen these guys climbing around on the ledges or on our boardwalk or on sticks and branches. They're very, very cute. And I think they deserve their name, woolly bear. They do look like a little woolly bear. Now, these caterpillars will turn into moths, but throughout the winter time, they actually stay in their caterpillar phase. So these little caterpillars will crawl into leaf litter or um, underneath logs, and basically they'll go into a hibernation mode and they'll shut down all their internal organs. Well, not completely shut down, but they'll start to slow down and their body will basically freeze. Now, the only way that they survive this is that they have this sugary chemical that occurs in their body and it's basically like an antifreeze. So their internal organs and their cells are still alive and they're, they're pumped with antifreeze so that they're not freezing completely solid. But everything else about the body is frozen. So there've been some stories where these caterpillars have actually been frozen in, into thick ice. And when the spring melt comes, these caterpillars will just come out like nothing even happened, which is really incredible. So uh, in the spring, they will emerge. Um, they'll start moving around and eating again. And I think that's actually why they have such dark colors is that they're coming out in the springtime. Um, they're very cold still, and they're trying to suck up as much as that sunlight as possible. So they have these dark, dark colorations to kind of keep in the heat as much as they can. They will then um, cocoon quickly in the springtime and they'll become adults. Now, the sad story is these caterpillars are living months at a time underneath a log or in leaf litter, um, getting ready for the spring melt and, and getting ready to become a beautiful moth. And then they only live about one to two weeks and then they die. So it's kind of sad story, but pretty interesting still. Oh, I do have a question coming up. This is a sound fight. So um, the next species, it does the exact same thing, the exact same kind of hibernation strategy as this caterpillar here. So I'm wondering if you guys can take a guess. This is a, um, a species of amphibian that comes out in the springtime. So let's see if you guys can guess what species this is. Kind of hurt your ears a bit <laughs> and that's one individual um amphibian that's making that noise but um in the springtime these there will be hundreds of them sometimes and it is even um harder to listen to it hurts your ears when you go outside and you hear them all um singing at once some some good uh clues there stephanie yeah. uh, amphibian i think is the is a big one and yes also like just the one was uh, a little hard on the ears. So uh, yeah. imagine a symphony of a hundred of them. Uh, so we have a few answers coming in here. Uh, peeper frog, very specific. Um, also from Robin, peeper, I'm gonna assume peeper frog. And then Rosemary kind of followed it up, frog. Uh, from Anna, slightly different tree frog. Okay. Uh, but we got mostly frogs, spring peepers, uh, also wood frog. Um, okay. That's from Terrence, but uh, it seems to be yes a lot of uh, frog guesses. Although there's a little bit of a split in opinion as to specifically which kind of frog. So uh, enlighten us, please. Okay. So I think the majority got it right. This is a spring peeper. I will say though, the sound is similar to a wood frog, and also. Um, similar to not the sound but the species is actually a type of tree frog so tree frog is kind of correct um but this is a spring peeper they uh emerge really really early in the springtime and they'll be making that sound it's super super hard to listen to it's deafening sometimes as it's so loud um but these spring peepers actually do something very interesting just like the caterpillar they'll hide under leaf litter or underneath a log and they will completely freeze and these frogs will also have some sort of antifreeze within their body that keeps them alive um, throughout the winter time just enough um, to make it into the springtime and it's really smart that they're doing this because they can emerge right away in the winter time 
when the first snow melts and even when there's some snow still on the ground these spring peepers will come out they'll start singing and they'll start mating right away and this is so that they kind of get their eggs into each of the little vernal pools before all of the other frogs kind of start to join them so great guesses i'm glad that people got are getting these Now our next question here, um, I think this might be the second last question. So this is a Midland painted turtle. It's one of the turtles that uh, lives at Riverwood. Um, another kind of turtle that lives at Riverwood as well is obviously our common snapping turtle. Um, I love turtles, they're amazing, amazing creatures. Um, they also go into somewhat of a hibernation. Well, they do go into hibernation. Um, their uh, hibernation is called brumation, like we talked about before. Now. Turtles breathe air, so they're mostly aquatic animals, um, just like whales are mostly aquatic, but they breathe air. They still need oxygen, so they come to the, to the surface of the water to breathe. But in the winter time, these turtles actually go all the way to the bottom of ponds and lakes, um, and they bury themselves in the mud. And then the ice freezes over these lakes and ponds and the turtles stay down there and hibernate. So my question to everyone, this one's very hard, but we'll see if there's some turtle experts in the crowd. Um, how do turtles survive throughout the wintertime in hibernation if they aren't coming up for air? Ooh. Hard question. Ooh, that is a good question. Okay, so how do turtles survive their hibernation if they're underwater underwater all Not kind of rare. And, and sorry how long would they stay underwater uh five six months five months okay five months. <laughs> okay so turtle underwater mm -hmm. five months mm -hmm. doesn't die mm -hmm. how is that possible yeah uh, so yeah so best uh, guesses or or answers from uh from everyone please drop them into the comments now uh, we are hoping for some from turtle experts to enlighten us uh <laughs> There's always turtle experts out there. Okay, so here's um first answer coming in. Taking the oxygen through their bums. Through their bones. No, no, bums. B-U-M-S. B-U-M-S? Oh, they're bums. Yeah. Okay. Oxygen from the backside uh, is the first <laughs> is the first hypothesis. Okay. Uh, and and C is also saying maybe I remembered that wrong. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, that I mean, I, yeah. That's uh, if that is if that is the answer. Uh, I think we're all going to remember that uh, at the end of tonight. Uh, uh, answer coming in from uh, Fatima. They go into their shell, so just they park themselves in the shell, and that in itself provides enough air supply, I guess, to to get them through the five six months of hibernation. Yeah. Uh, any more? guesses uh now's the time to drop them into the comment this is a tricky one mm -hmm. uh, and you wouldn't necessarily think of a frog just spending that long sorry a turtle spending that long underwater uh, mm -hmm. and surviving and maybe the last one here air pockets in the frozen water uh okay. Luvon's, uh answer on that um uh, from ibu uh the answer make an air bubble out of mucus mm. A good, a good thought. Uh, yeah. Some really nice, uh, uh, innovative uh, uh, adaptation there. I like and uh, from Lisa, breathing through their skin, so okay. letting oxygen is come uh, coming through their skin. Yeah. So I guess we're gonna leave it at that for now. With uh, a pretty wide range of, uh, <laughs> of of answers, including taking in oxygen through the rear. Uh, <laughs> so somebody, is that the answer, or what is the answer? They are actually correct in saying that uh, oxygen is taken in through the bum um, or the tail <laughs> opening is what we like to say. Um, so the turtles actually in the wintertime will stay underneath the water um, and in their tail opening and on their necks, they have specialized glands. And in the ox or sorry, in the water, there's a little bit of oxygen, obviously, because it's H2O. So there is some oxygen in the water. Um, so what they do with those specialized gland at the tail opening and on the neck um, is they take in water and they extract the very little amount of oxygen that's in the water, and they use that in order to somewhat breathe throughout the winter time. So uh, I think it would be like a combination of everybody's answers, but um, the first one was correct, actually. 
<laughs> think, and, and, and yes, so uh, it was uh, the first comment of uh, taking oxygen in through the bum is correct. And no, you did not remember that wrong. Uh, <laughs> see who uh, was the first person to post that. And I think as a result, I think none of us are going to remember that wrong exactly. going forward. You'll always remember that. You'll never look at it <laughs> the same way again. And you'll never swim in a lake the same way again. <laughs> That's great. Um, one thing to mention about turtles until we get into the next portion, um, turtles are really struggling right now with many different environmental factors, but the biggest thing that they're struggling with is, well, one of the biggest things is uh, road mortalities or even just being hit by cars. So um, when these turtles go into lakes and ponds and they go into hibernation, they need to be in peak performance because all of their internal organs are basically slowing way down. Their immune system is basically shutting down. So they need to be in peak performance. If these turtles are hit by a car or just nudged by a car and they have a crack in the shell, it can be um, life changing for these turtles. When they go into hibernation, they may not survive the winter time because of that. So um, this summer when the turtles start coming out again, just make sure you're always watching where you're driving. And if you do see a turtle crossing the road, always try to help it. Um, make sure that you're safe first, but always try to help it across the road. Okay, and then the last portion is tolerating species. So this is a little bit different. These are species that basically hang out throughout the entire winter time. They don't go into hibernation and they don't migrate to places like Mexico and Costa Rica, places that we all wanna be right now. So a big one is birds. So if you come to Riverwood, um, we have tons of birds that you can feed, you can watch. Um, all of these bird species actually tolerate the winter time. So they hang out all the way through the winter. And I have a, uh, my last question for the night is, um, I'm gonna play a sound bite of a bird and I'm gonna ask if anybody knows what kind of bird this is. It's a quite common species of bird and I'm sure you guys have heard it at Riverwood before. A little quiet. Very common sound mm -hmm. at Riverwood. Sounds like spring. <laughs> it is nice just to hear it and and feel a little warmer. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, you know, like all the, all the wildlife that you just mentioned, uh, we too have to tolerate. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, some. Answers coming in here from Anna, guessing chickadee, mm -hmm. uh, Sheena, chickadee, and yes, now, oh, okay, we got a lot, lot more coming in uh, from Lisa, chickadee, mm -hmm. from Patricia, a little more specific, black capped chickadee. Nice. Trying to upstage everyone here, Patricia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, chickadee from Robin, Fatima, chickadee. And, uh, and 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 from Ibu, just uh, switching it up here, chicka d d d d. Yeah, I remember, so. right? <laughs> <laughs> so everyone is right. It is a chickadee, or more specifically, um, like somebody said, a black-capped chickadee. Um, they're very very common species that we have around Riverwood. You'll almost always see one, or it will be following you down the trail trying to get food um, from your hand. Um, now, something pretty cool about these chickadees is they have um, a way of growing their brains just slightly in the fall time. And the reason they do that is in the fall, they instinctually start caching away food. So they'll get seeds, insects, um, berries, things like that. They'll take it, they'll put it behind bark or they'll hide it under a log or somewhere hidden. And they have to remember hundreds, if not thousands of these cache spots. So their brain actually builds new connections and new cells in order to remember where they put all these places, where they put all these foods. So it's pretty incredible. When spring comes back around and they no longer need to struggle to get food and they no longer need to remember where those cache points are, their brain actually cuts off those connections and gets rid of unneeded brain cells. Um, so it kind of shrinks and then it grows in the fall to remember and then it shrinks again in the spring, which is pretty incredible. Now it's a great time of year to go and feed the chickadees for this very reason is that they don't have a lot of food resources. So they're really struggling to, to find food. We have some great volunteers on site um, that will fill, 
fill the bird feeders for us so that all these birds have food throughout the winter time, which is so awesome. We really appreciate them. Um, but the chickadees will also come to your hand and even on top of your hat like this lady here because they trust you and they know they can associate that humans means food. So they'll go to your hand, they'll take some seed and maybe they'll eat it right away or they'll go and cache it. So next time you're on site, bring some black oil sunflower seeds with you and try to feed some of our birds and then watch to see where they go. They may try to hide it behind bark or something like that, which is pretty cool. Now we have many mammal species that also tolerate our winters. They usually have lots of fur coats to stay warm, just like us putting on a winter jacket. The probably the most interesting one is our beaver. And this is the last animal I will talk about tonight. Um, the beaver is an incredible species and it is made for all seasons. And you know, a lot of times we think that beavers would hibernate because we don't see them in the winter time, but there's kind of a reason why we don't see them in the winter time as much at least. So like we know that beavers build dams on streams or rivers, basically wherever they hear running water, they'll put mud and sticks on top of it to stop that movement of water and basically to back up that stream or river and create an ecosystem. So one of the main reasons we call beavers ecosystem engineers is because they create their own ecosystem or habitat for where they live in. So they've created this beaver pond. They um, now can have food sources that are in the water like water lilies. Um, they have protection from coyotes or if you're farther north, they have protection from wolves because they are always in the water. Um, they're mainly aquatic mammals. So they're always in the water but as well in the winter time they've created a habitat where um, the pond won't freeze all the way to the bottom so the beavers can still live and swim around underneath the ice layer that's on the water in the winter time which is pretty incredible um, you may think that'd be really cold water, but their fur is actually specially designed for that. So they have two layers in their coat fur. Um, the first layer is kind of like a rain jacket. It's sleek and it gets rid of and it repels water off of them um, so that they don't feel the wetness to their skin. And then the second layer, if you were to pull back the fur on um, the beaver, they have a second layer that's very fluffy and it's all interconnected and it has little hooks almost like velcro and they all interconnect like this and the reason for that is the water one can't reach their skin any farther and another reason is it's kind of like a winter jacket so it's it's fluffy and it's nice and warm and it keeps them warm in the winter so their fur is specifically designed for winter um, weather for sure Another thing that um, beavers have that allow them to live in the cold temperatures is, is based on their tail. So often um, when we see a beaver and we see the tail, we kind of have two ideas about the tail. One is it's slapping the top or the surface of the water. And the reason it's doing this is to warn any other beavers that are in the area that there's a coyote or there's some sort of predator nearby. You need to go into the water, get to safety and hide. Um, often they will do this if they see you as well. Another thing beavers use their tail for is kind of like a rubber, a, a rudder, like um, on a paddle boat. So it will move back and forth to allow them to swim smoothly through the water. In the winter time though, these tails are actually very helpful. Um, these tails are an extremity on their body, just like our fingers or our ears or our toes. Um, in the winter time, those are usually where we get coldest because they're extremities. They're out from our body, where all of our body has our heat in here. These often get the coldest, the fastest, right? Beavers, that's in their tail. So they can actually move blood in and out of this tail um, in order to either uh, get rid of heat or to conserve heat. So in the summertime, they'll move more blood to their tails and this allows for some heat to disperse from their body so that they can cool down in, in very hot temperatures. In the winter time, they actually suck that blood back in from their tail and conserve it inside of their body so that their body can stay warm, but their tails will actually get very, very cold cold and this isn't a big deal because they don't have any important organs inside of their tail so it doesn't really matter the tail is pretty good at getting down to temperatures of like five to three to five degrees celsius which is incredible 
Now, um, one reason why we don't see these beavers in the wintertime is because they spend most of their time in their lodges um, and then they'll only go into the water to eat. Uh, they normally don't leave the beaver pond actual area unless they run out of food resources. So this picture, really bad, but I tried. Um, there's uh, the main areas inside of the actual beaver lodge. They usually have two to three kind of entrances and exits that they can come in and out underneath the water so they're always going into the water from their lodge and normally they have some sort of stash or a uh, cache kind of similar to what chickadees do but they have it all in one location so they'll have piles of branches and barks and sticks all piled up on each other underneath the water or underneath the ice and basically these beavers can leave the lodge out through the exit and go get some food and then bring it right back inside um, to stay warm and be eating indoors like that so it's pretty cool. It's kind of like us humans getting out of bed when it's really cold, going to get food from the kitchen, then going back to bed. One really great sign, and especially in the wintertime, if you're looking for signs of beavers, this is a great sign. Chop down trees or half chop down trees, um, especially around a water area. Beavers don't go too far off into the woods to cut down trees or get branches or food. And the reason being is because if they go too far, they're very, very slow walkers and they're easy prey for predators like coyotes or wolves to kind of just pick off and eat them. Now, one thing I'm just gonna go into um, um, a little promo is if you see something like this, you could always add it to our uh, winter bio blitz that's going on right now. So if you're watching this right now, you need to join iNaturalist. We have a project called TRC Winter Bio Blitz 2020. Rashid um, talked about it a little bit at the start, but if you were to see something like cut down trees and things like that, you can actually snap an image of that and add it to this bio blitz, just the image itself, and that will count as a species of uh, for your for your list. So we do have a couple front runners right now. Um, they are trying to uh, get as many species as possible on iNaturalist within Riverwoods boundaries to try and win a um, book by Dave Taylor called Predators of North America. Um, so please, if you can join, and especially during the holiday season, it's a great thing to do with your family or your friends um, and just come and see us whenever we're on site as well, which is great. But that is the end of my presentation. Um, I want to thank you all so, so much. And I guess we have some time to take some questions too, Rashid. Yes, we do. Awesome. We do. Uh, and first of all, Stephanie, thank you so much for another excellent presentation. Thanks to everyone watching for, uh, for interacting with us uh, a little bit more tonight. We always uh, enjoy uh, getting the comments from you and, and hearing what you have to say. And, and you're clearly some wildlife experts uh, watching, <laughs> especially turtle experts. Yes. Uh, so one, uh, going back to the uh, monarch butterfly for one second, if I can pull up the question from a little bit earlier, uh, you were talking about how they migrate. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the factors that would trigger their migration other than the changing temperature? Yeah, so um, there, it's still like a huge mystery. Even with birds, migration is um, a really big mystery because it's all instinctual, right? So um, it's mostly temperature, but also it's where the sun is in the sky. So as we um, go into winter time, we have shorter day lengths and the sun is lower in the sky. Um, in peak summer, the sun is right over top of our head and it's um, out for longer periods of time. So they think that it's something to do with the sun, the temperature, but also the magnetic field of our planet. And that is going way too far into my knowledge, but it's something to do with um, the magnetic field of our of the earth, the sun, and um, the temperatures as well. Okay. A uh, question coming from Louvon. Hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Uh, talking about the chickadees growing their brains in the mm -hmm. fall. Yeah. Uh, are they used in neuroscience research or labs? Uh, because this would be, I would think, a pretty interesting thing for uh, people to, or for researchers to study. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. Uh, I'm sure that they are aware of it. I don't know if it would be the same as in a human human brain, but you'd have to think that it'd be something interesting for them as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea. I have no idea. A really interesting question, and uh, if yeah. that hasn't if it hasn't been studied, 
researchers get on that. Right, uh, right. Question, <laughs> question from Donna uh, about coyotes. Would they be categorized as the as a tolerator of winter? Coyotes? Yes. Yes, yes absolutely. So, um, uh, especially, so coyotes and wolves are both tolerators. Um, they rely a lot on beavers, especially in more northern areas. Um, beavers are a huge prey animal for um, wolves and coyotes. Uh, but we've been seeing a lot of coyotes on site. And also, when you're walking at Riverwood as well, look on the ground. Um, sometimes you can see coyote tracks early in the morning on a first snowfall you can see the coyote tracks going through the winter so they're still relying on animals like squirrels um rabbits small mammals things like that throughout the winter time a uh, question from c just kind of a, a general question i think that a lot of us are interested to know is why do some animals hibernate while others stick around for the winter so like you're know, looking at the bear as an, as an example why is would they go into hibernation or their version of hibernation as yeah. opposed to just you know, being out and about throughout the winter so that's a really good question um i i don't have uh the absolute answer uh what i will say from my own knowledge is if every animal did the exact same th thing to adapt for winter weather there would be so much more competition um, if you think all of the bird species that tolerate the winter time, if they all adapted to migrate south every single winter, there would be hundreds, thousands of species of birds all in one location, um, all surviving off the same food. So some species stick around and just tolerate the winter. And one thing I'll point out is there's a, a bird called a gray jay, and they occur more north, and they tolerate the winter time just like our chickadees do. And basically, they have first um, dibs on territory, food, um, nesting grounds. They nest very early so that they don't have any competition against um the birds that are migrating back north in the summertime if that makes sense um i don't know the absolute answer to that but i hope that kind of makes sense there's less competition um if animals aren't all adapting uh to do the same thing right and i think that kind of feeds into uh another question that we had from fatima which is why do cats not hibernate I guess, you know, uh, kind of what you just talked about, you know, potential more competition for uh, resources if they, uh, if they, if they had, a, uh, if, if everybody did the same thing come winter, yeah. uh, but also I guess for cats, maybe some domesticated, they're just now used to more indoor environments, warmer um, environments. Yeah. And as well, we have to think about where cats and dogs came from, right? They can't, so cats came at, I actually have no idea where cats came from, but <laughs> some sort of a wild species of cat and dogs came from things like wolves and coyotes. And both of those kind of mammals, they tolerate the winter time, right? So they're hunting for food. They're usually top predators. So like cats um, and other species of cats eat small mammals and other things like that. And so do, so do dog species. So I would say it's more so genetic, like they've always just um, tolerated the winter time. Mm -hmm. uh, a comment from Luvon who had that original question about the chickadees being used for neuroscience, mm -hmm. uh, saying that I'll do a little digging, read neuroscience research, uh, and the gorgeous chickadees. So Luvon, thanks for uh, <laughs> digging a little bit further into that for me. Yeah, and then uh, <laughs> and uh, just a nice comment from Robin who said, thank you, so enjoyable. You guys are great. Looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Thanks we so really appreciate that. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. And the last question that we'll get today coming from Terrence uh, regarding the BioBlitz. Yes. Uh, for people who are taking part in the BioBlitz, are there any easy to spot mammals in Riverwood other than squirrels? Huh, other than squirrels. Mm. Tough time of the year too, I guess, for, for some yeah. mammal spotting. Easy to spot, uh, not so much um because the next i'm thinking like deer uh coyote raccoon like you don't see those as often um foxes don't see them as often either um but another thing to kind of go back is tracks are always a viable um option for the bio blitz so you can always take a picture of tracks and try to identify it um there's some great tracking materials and even dave taylor did a 
a presentation last week on tracking. So um, tracks like footprint or fur or anything like that is, is still a viable option to submit to iNaturalist and you can actually still get that species in there. Um, but anything easier than seeing like the individual um, squirrels are always going to be the only one. It's a it's, it's a it's it's a tough time, I guess, to be uh, observing a lot of mammals. But uh, yeah. yeah, very good point that you bring up that uh, with iNaturalist, the tracks count uh, yeah. towards our bioblitz as well, and they are important. So uh, keep yeah. your eyes peeled, no matter where you are and, and what you're exploring at Riverwood. And hope you do uh, manage to come out, uh, take part in our bar in our bioblitz, which runs until December 31st. So still plenty of time for you to get to Riverwood. And uh, if we do have a snowfall between now and December 31st might be an opportunity for some track spotting as well. Uh, to anyone who we couldn't get to your questions tonight, sorry that we ran out of time, but thank you for so much for taking part. Uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your answers to our questions as we went through the presentation today. Uh, once again, for more information on the BioBlitz, head to our website, theriverwoodconservancy.org. And while you're there, if you're looking for any gift ideas for the holiday season, why not look at our nature gift guide, uh, full of lots of options that will let you send e-cards to the people that matter to you. It's an eco-friendly way of sending gifts this holiday season. It's also a way of maintaining social distance this holiday season. And it helps us uh, continue with our environmental work at Riverwood in terms of protecting wildlife habitat and continuing programs like this so we can keep bringing nature education to the people, uh, which is our job. So Stephanie, once again, thank you so much for your time and your expertise today. Uh, everyone for taking part in our presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, please stay safe and we hope to see you again very soon. Thanks everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.